In this video, we turn our attention to predicates, which are sentences involving one or more variables. For example, we may define p of x to be the sentence x is greater than zero. Since x is a variable in the sentence, p of x is a predicate. There is nothing special in the letter x, so we can define another predicate q of n to be n squared minus 2n minus 3 equals 0. We can throw in more variables to have r of x and y defined as, for every positive real number x, there is a real number y such that y squared equals x. It is important to bear in mind that predicates are not statements, because it is not meaningful to talk about the truth values when variables are present. Nonetheless, we can still define the four connectives we use in statements on predicates, and they would still make sense. For example, using the predicates we have defined, not p and q means x is greater than 0, and n squared minus 2n minus 3 is 0. Now, suppose we have two predicates, p and q. We say that p implies q, written as p arrow q, but with two horizontal lines, when q is true, given that p is true. There are many alternative ways to say p implies q, and that is important for us to basically recognize all of them. Firstly, we have, if p is true, then q is true, or simply, if p, then q. For some people, this definition is better in capturing the idea of implication, but it is a bit clumsy to write as a definition. From now on, let me drop the phrase is true and just write p to mean p is true. Next, we have q if p and p only if q. Do not confuse these two sayings. The addition of the word only swaps the positions of p and q. Then, we have, if q is false, then p is false. This is just a contrapositive of if p then q, which we know are equivalent. Two more sayings which are perhaps less common, but are important at a later stage. They are, p is sufficient for q, and q is necessary of p. The first one means that for q to be true, it is enough to have p to be true. The second one means that for p to be true, it is necessary that q is true. We can think about these two sayings by using two circles to represent p and q. This idea provides an important perspective in understanding the concept of implication. p implies q means that the circle of p lies entirely inside the circle of q. Here, p is sufficient for q means that if I lie inside the circle of p, then it is enough to guarantee that I'm inside the circle of Q. On the other hand, Q is necessary of P means that if I want to be inside P, then it is necessary that I'm at least inside Q. In other words, if I'm not even inside Q, then I'm certainly not inside P. So, in some sense, P implies Q means that P is more specific than Q, or Q is more general than P. Of course, they can in fact be equivalent, which I will talk about later. Now, let's consider an example to clarify things. We ask the question, does n equals 3 imply n squared minus 2n minus 3 equals 0? To check that this is true, we assume that the left-hand side is true. That is, we suppose n equals 3. Then. We check whether the right-hand side is true, given this information. So, we substitute n equals 3 into n squared minus 2 n minus 3, and we get 3 squared minus 2 times 3 minus 3, which is in fact 0. So indeed, n squared minus 2 n minus 3 is 0, and that means the right-hand side is true. So the implication is true. Let's also consider the converse. Suppose n squared minus 2n minus 3 equals 0. We solve this quadratic equation to get n equals 3, or n equals negative 1. Since we have the possibility that n equals negative 1, we can't say that n equals 3. So the implication is false. We may let p and q be the two predicates, 
where we note that q is just equivalent to n equals 3 or n equals negative 1. So we may write 3 inside p and negative 1 outside p, and the whole thing is q. Now it is easy to see that p implies q, but q does not imply p. In the case where p implies q and q implies p, we say that p and q are equivalent. We represent it by a double arrow. Again, there are a few equivalent sayings. The most common one is p if and only if q, or simply p iffq. This is consistent with our previous definition because p if q means q implies p, and p only if q means p implies q. Then, we also have p is necessary and sufficient for q, or q is necessary and sufficient for p. In terms of a diagram, we may represent p and q by two circles which completely overlap each other, so they are essentially the same. If we know that one of them is true, then the other one must also be true. Let's use another example to illustrate equivalence. Is it true that x equals 7 and x plus y equals 15 equivalent to x equals 7 and y equals 8? We check both implications. First, let's check the only if part. So suppose x equals 7 and x plus y equals 15. Then we substitute x equals 7 into x plus y equals 15 to get 7 plus y equals 15 or y equals 8. So we have x equals 7 and y equals 8. So the only if part is true. Now let's check the if part. Suppose x equals 7 and y equals 8. Then we calculate x plus y to be 7 plus 8 equals 15. So we have x equals 7 and x plus y equals 15. This means that the if part is also true. Hence, the two predicates are equivalent. After introducing predicates, it is important to talk about quantifiers which appear very often in predicates. First, we have an upside-down A, which is the universal quantifier. It means for all, for any, for each, or basically a phrase which includes all possibilities. Secondly, we have a backwards E, which is the existential quantifier. It means there exists or there is. Note that there can be more than one possibility when this symbol is used and it just asserts that there is at least one. If we want to emphasize that there is only one possibility, then we can add an exclamation mark after the backwards E to mean that there exists a unique, or there is a unique. Let's try to rewrite predicates using these quantifiers. We have seen this predicate before, that is, for every positive real number x, there is a real number y, such that y squared equals x. We see for every, so we first write down an upside down a. We also have there is, so we put down a backwards e. Now, instead of writing positive real numbers x, we recall the symbols we learned in the set theory and write x in the real numbers and x greater than zero. For the remaining part, we may write s dot t dot to represent such that. We also note that y squared equals x is a shorter predicate p with variables x and y, but usually we'll just leave it as is. If the sentence had the extra word unique in place, then we would have to add an exclamation mark after the backwards e symbol. Next, consider the predicate. Given two integers a and b, a plus b is also an integer. Even though we cannot find a phrase like for any straight away, we see that the word given actually had a universal meaning. It means that no matter what integers a and b that you give me, a plus b is always an integer. So we can quantify a and b using the universal quantifier. So we have all a in the set of integers for all b in the set of integers 
a plus b is also in the set of integers. We may rewrite this more succinctly as for all a comma b in the set of integers, a plus b is in the set of integers. Since predicates often involve negation, it is important for us to know how we can negate quantifiers in order to negate predicates. So, we want to know what is the negation of for all x p of x and there is x p of x. To understand this, we consider the universal set u to be the set of numbers from 1 to n. These are the possible values that x can take. Then, we can rewrite for all x p of x as p of 1 and p of 2 and all the way to p of n, because for all x p of x means that p of x is true for every possible value of x, so we connect all the p of x by and. Also, there is x p of x can be rewritten as p of 1 or p of 2 or all the way to p of n, because there is x p of x means that p of x is true for at least one value of x, so we connect the p of x by all. Now, not for all x p of x is equivalent to not bracket p of 1 and p of 2 and all the way to p of n. Then, we apply De Morgan's law to rewrite this as not p of 1 or not p of 2 or all the way to not p of n. Bear in mind that De Morgan's law allows us to take the negation inside the individual predicates by swapping the ends with ors. Now, we observe that this is equivalent to there is x, not p of x. Similarly, we can show that not there is x, p of x is equivalent to for all x, not p of x. It should not be hard to understand that these results hold for any universal set, not just from 1 to n. So we have the following rules of negation. Whenever we see for all, we change it to there is. Whenever we see there is, we change it to for all. After each change, we can shift the negation to the right and negate smaller predicates. Let's try to negate this statement as an example. First, we see a there is, so we change it to for all and shift the negation to the right. Then, we have a for all right after the negation, so we change it to there is and further move the negation to the right. Then, we have not bracket p or q, so we apply the De Morgan's law to rewrite as not p and not q. So the required negation is for all x, there is y such that not p and not q. Let's consider another example. Suppose we want to negate for all epsilon greater than zero, there is n in the set of natural numbers such that for all n greater or equal to n, the absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon. As before, we change for all to there is, so there is epsilon greater than zero, such that, usually we have the phrase such that after there is, then we have a there is, so we change it to for all. Another for all, so we change it to there is, and then add such that. Finally, we let p to be the predicate absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon. To form not p, we just need to change the less than to greater than or equal to. So, the whole sentence is, there is epsilon greater than zero, such that, for all n in the set of natural numbers, there is n greater than or equal to n, such that, the absolute value of a n minus a is greater than or equal to epsilon. We end this video with a harder example. Let's say we want to negate the statement. For every video that you watch, if you give a like, then you are awesome. First, we can rewrite the statement using symbols. For all video that you watch, then bracket, 
you give a like, arrow, you are awesome. To negate this, let P be, you give a like, and Q be, you are awesome. We already know how to negate for all, so it boils down to negating P arrow Q. For this, we call the property that P arrow Q is equivalent to not P or Q. So, not P arrow Q is equivalent to not bracket not P or Q, which by De Morgan's law is equivalent to not not P and not Q, which simplifies to P and not Q. So the required negation is, there is a video that you watch such that you give a like and you are not awesome.